thank you, Linda. And I want to thank Cassie. Uh, can we put the timer to 60 minutes, please? So I'm very privileged uh, this morning to be with you. And uh, I was thinking last night uh, of Edgar Mitchell, who was a good friend, actually visited the center many times. And so it's a great privilege to be here uh, in the memory of Edgar. I want to thank Cassie for inviting me. And uh, I was reminiscing about uh, something that happened 50 years ago. Uh, as you know, we are celebrating the 50 years of landing on the moon, humans on the moon. <clears throat> I was at that time a medical student in India, and um, in my final year, and uh, I was doing a rotation in um, a small village outside of Delhi uh, called Balakar. And at that time, there was no electricity, there was no running water. Of course, I had a radio along with my fellow medical students, and we heard the news that humans were on the moon. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, the villagers brought a young man who was about 15 years old, teenager, and uh, they brought him to our dispensary. And they said, Dr. Chopra, can you give him an injection? He's, this young person has gone mad. He's insane. So I said, why do you say he's insane? Well, he just returned from Delhi and he's telling us <laughs> that, uh, that there are men on the moon. <laughs> I said, actually, that's true. <laughs> and they looked at me as if I needed the injection, too. <laughs> they said, what moon are you talking about? <laughs> they asked me. And uh, I said, the moon that... Um, Americans have landed on. I said, oh, I see. That's not the moon we worship. We have another moon that we worship. And she exists only in our consciousness. This came from illiterate villagers. Um, of course, you know, you know that Einstein is reputed to have said the moon would still be there if no one was looking at it. So let's talk about that this morning. Is the moon there if no one is looking at it? If you go on, um, on Google and you ask yourself, um, what are the open questions in science today? These two will crop up. This was Science Magazine, 2008. And, um, there are 125 open questions in science. The first of them is, what's the universe made of? And we should talk about that because uh, actually no one knows what the universe is made of. The only thing that they agree on is that it's made of nothing. <laughs> so if it's made of nothing, why does it look like everything else? <laughs> That is the number one open question in science. The number two open question in science is, uh, what's the biological basis of consciousness? And I think they're related, if you can uh, look at these two questions, because we only know the universe because we experience it. Okay? Without the experience of the universe, there's no knowing of the universe. Uh, whatever it's made of, there's no knowing of the universe in the absence of our experience of it. And our experience of it is very species specific. There are horseshoe crabs that live in the depths of the ocean, 
with no exposure to moonlight. And yet, on a full moon day, they'll come from the depths of the ocean to lay eggs for the next reproductive cycles. It's obvious that the moon is a very different experience to a horseshoe crab or to a bat um, or to any other species. As humans, of course, we have uh, created models of reality ever since we began to ask questions. If you look at um, deep history, uh, you will see that people talk about something called the cognitive revolution. It seems that uh, 30, 40,000 years ago, there were at least eight different species of humans. We call ourselves Homo sapiens, which means the wise ones. A name we gave to ourselves. Great <laughs> <laughs> <And> humility. <laughs> But then we gave names to other species too. Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo neanderthals, Floroensis, etc., etc. And it seems that all these different species of humans, the human family, just like you have the cat family, you know, you have cats and leopards and cheetahs and lions. They're all different species but the same family. It seems all members of the human family had a rudimentary language. Basically mating calls and danger calls. That's it. Till one species, us, we developed a language for telling stories. And uh, that created the human experience. Apparently the first stories we were told were gossip. <laughs> and I think they're the most important stories even today. We are obsessed with gossip. But as soon as we started uh, telling stories, we started creating models of reality. And started asking ourselves questions. Where did the universe come from? Do we have a soul? Does God exist? What happens to us after we die? Etc. Etc. And this started our whole quest for trying to understand what we call reality. So a very brief history would say that the first stories about the universe were this model, the divine universe, God, usually thought of as, um, at least until recently, usually thought of as a dead white male somewhere, <laughs> uh, created the universe and is the source and origin of mind. And this idea, this story, led to first mythology, then religion, which is a form of cultural mythology, and then two other systems of thought, philosophy, theology, etc. And these flourished and gave rise to mostly all of civilization until um, um, Newton showed up and he described the laws of motion, universal uh, gravitation, actually the laws were first described by Kepler and Newton explained them and very successfully explained the motion of objects on earth and of celestial bodies and the laws of thermodynamics. These are the laws that um, were used to uh, send men to the moon. So they work, right? <laughs> They work. These are the laws we use when we fly jet planes and go from one location to another. And these are the laws that created most of civilization. And at this time, there were other luminaries Great thinkers, Leibniz, Descartes, Spinoza, Voltaire, and all moving away from traditional religious, mythological, philosophical explanations of our existence. And um, they've been around for 300 years and we use them in our technology. It was um, 
um, not until Einstein that uh, we began to think a little differently. So Einstein, of course, uh, came up with two theories, uh, the special theory of relativity in 1905. And today, every school child learns that E is equal to mc squared. The matter and energy are the same thing in different expressions. The speed of light is constant. And um, that, um, uh, it's constant for all frames of reference. In 1915, Einstein actually came up with a new theory. Uh, we call that the general theory of relativity, which basically described uh, uh, laws of gravity as the curvature of space-time gave rise to ideas like black holes, which are now documented. You've seen the pictures and uh, gravitational redshift of light, gravitational time decay. So as we look at the relativistic universe, you see it's much more dynamic, and you begin to realize that uh, space-time, matter, and we might say add to that information, are all interdependent. And as you know, recently gravitational waves were documented and led to a Nobel Prize. So, very valid again. The theory works for what it looks at. And it was around the same time that um, we also had another theory, uh, the quantum universe. Albert Einstein was a reluctant participant, <laughs> um, but the main authors of quantum theory were Niels Bohr, Schrodinger, Max Planck, Paul Dirac, Werner Heisenberg. Um, this year is the 90th uh, anniversary birth, birthday of Henry Stapp at Berkeley, who was the only living physicist of that era. And of course, this created a whole new revolution. As you know, quantum theories don't match with uh, relativity. They're in conflict with each other. In any case, uh, these are some of the things that uh, quantum mechanics deals with. The behavior of electrons and photons and other elementary particles it deals with fundamental processes. Uh, which at a very fundamental level of reality, if you want to call this reality or existence, are ambiguous. In waves and particles, the movement of atoms is random. There's something called the uncertainty principles. You cannot know the momentum or the location of a particle at the same time. According to the classic Copenhagen interpretation, observation causes collapse of wave function, Wave function provides information about the probability uh, of the position of momentum and other physical proper, proper properties of atoms. And there's this whole new idea of non-locality, that at the fundamental level, everything is correlated with everything else. At the cost of sounding very abstract, that the, there's a notion that at the fundamental level of existence, there's something called a causal, without cause, non-local, outside of space-time, quantum mechanical interrelatedness. Everything is correlated with everything else. Synchronicity. And the, fundamentally, the universe functions as a whole, but probably not in space-time. Now, um, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up the interpretations of quantum mechanics, you will see that there are several. Let me show you the slide here. And interpretations are basically sets of statements that uh, attempt to explain quantum mechanics beyond the recipes it gives for performing calculations. And this question is of special interest to philosophers and physicists. Nobody argues about the math. 
and the math works. And it's the basis now of 60 to 70 percent of our world economy. Every time you use your handheld device, you send somebody a text message or email or an audio or a film. Uh, all our technologies today, based on the calculations, mathematical calculations of quantum mechanics. But the interpretation, what does it mean, are several. This is a chart from Wikipedia. <laughs> and the list keeps growing. The list keeps growing. Right now, um, the most popular theory is what we call many worlds or meta worlds or multiverses. Sean Carroll, who's the chief of physicist at, uh, at Caltech is coming out with a book uh, on the interpretations of quantum mechanics and he firmly believes in the uh, multiverse theory. Uh, but until recently, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation has been uh, the most popular. So let me show you a short video which was prepared by my friend Christina uh, Virchilo, who's here in the audience somewhere. Um, she helped me make this video and I'm going to show it to you. It's just a three minutes or so. Uh, let's see it. The biggest mystery of our existence is our own existence. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where do we go when we die? Where is the soul? Do we have a soul? What is our true nature? When we look closely, the true nature of reality is revealed to us. Looking closer than molecules and atoms, we enter the realm of quantum reality. At this level of reality, there is no matter. What we think of as tiny particles are actually not material at all, but waves of potential. The waves represent different potential outcomes of reality. Only when observed does the wave collapse into one perceived outcome and is seen again as a particle. The physical world as we see it is not reality. The true nature of reality is pure potential, infinite possibilities, infinite creativity. This true reality has no beginning and no end. It does not exist in space and time. Space and time exist within it. And this we call consciousness. Our existence and the existence of everything we see is dependent on a conceptualizing consciousness. This consciousness conceives, governs, constructs, and becomes the universe. Our experience as beings within the universe is a continual activity within consciousness. What we experience as images, sensations, thoughts, emotions and feelings are all qualities of consciousness. Consciousness and its qualities are all that exist. This is our true identity. We experience the world from our subjective point of view. We see objects and beings as existing in their own right, separate from us. This is an illusion. In the end, we are all that one consciousness that is simultaneously all observers, all modes of observation, and all objects of observation. I am that, you are that, all this is that, and that alone is. In the words of the great Sufi poet Rumi, you're not just the drop in the ocean, you are the mighty ocean in the drum. So, so you know, I was very happy with this video when we made it, but there's something wrong with it. <laughs> And uh, what's wrong with it is that it assumes that um, consciousness is embodied. That you and I 
our embodied consciousness. And I'm going to question that. Uh, so this video is good, but it's not actually accurate. Okay. Let's address that, but before we do that, right now, this is the state of awareness. Eternal inflation. A theory that has become very popular, uh, credited to Andre Linde from Stanford. And it's very difficult to explain this unless you're a mathematician. So I asked my friend Joel Premack, who's one of the authors of the Double Dog Theory, to explain it. And uh, this is how he explained it. Imagine there's a cosmic Las Vegas. And um, in the cosmic Las Vegas, there are infinite casinos. And um, in these infinite ca casinos, there are infinite slot machines. And each of these is throwing a coin randomly. And if the coin comes back heads up, it doubles in size. If the coin comes back tails up, it halves in size. Now imagine a scenario where you have an infinite trail of coins all coming up, tails up, which means they keep halving till they reach blank size. And the cosmic casino has uh, a little hole in it that are about blank size. And that uh, little blank size wave function escapes from the casino and spins off into a universe. And because there are infinite casinos with infinite slot machines, with infinite ups and downs, there are infinite universes. This is the most popular theory right now. Uh, more abstract, more, uh, more challenging to our imagination than any mythical story that you can think of. But this is the most popular. It's the basis of the Mojibas theory. And then there are all these related theories, super string. Uh, they're all basically functions of the same theory. Many worlds, multiverse, M theories, Stephen Hawking and my co-author, Leonard Malarno, uh, who wrote You Are the Universe with me, uh, subscribed to M theory, which posits 10 to the power of 500 universes at least. 10 to the power of 500 universes. Of course, there's no data or observations to any of these, and uh, they're basically metaphysical theories uh, mathematical metaphysics. Uh, but math works. So, you know, because math works, people have confidence in these theories.